We're now going to talk about an issue that is very important in the scientific world that we're living in today. And it's also very important to those who want to choose whether to believe in something that the Bible says or what science is saying. Was there a universal flood or was there not a universal flood? This is a critical question. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We have this amazing story that the Bible says that there was a universal flood, that God destroyed man of the face of the earth. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, that's pretty specific, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So something from the bottom, subterranean water, shot forth, plus the windows of heaven were opened, it rained from the top. So somehow the earth must have split open and huge columns of water shot up out of the earth, maybe as a crack raced around the earth, opening up a fissure out of which water under great pressure shot forth. That is what the Bible says. I'm merely reading what it says. Whatever caused it, nobody knows. Some might conjecture that some asteroid or something struck the earth and that it crashed down and caused this event to happen. Whether it was so or not, we cannot conjecture at this moment. In Amos 9 verse 6 it said, It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven and has founded his troop in the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So here is a description of taking the waters of the sea and pouring them over the land. Now in the previous lecture, that's what we looked at. So the sediments that we had on the ocean floors are now all deposited over here on the land basins. And when lifted up, you have the geological column formed. And all the sediments are on the land when they should be in the bottom of the sea. Now this tallies with what Amos 9 verse 6 has to say. Now if this flood lasted one year and 17 days according to its chronology and reached its highest peak after about five months, where the Bible says that the waters covered the land, then everything was underwater. And if everything was underwater then that means that everything was destroyed. And even in the New Testament, it says, and the flood came and took them all away. Now, science cannot afford a universal flood because that would destroy all terrestrial life on earth, terrestrial life, and the whole evolutionary process would have to start from point A, But since it needs its origin right at the base of the column, that would be a major problem. History would have to repeat itself a second time over. So obviously they might conceive of a local flood, but a universal flood, forget it. Now, if we look at this geological column, there are some very interesting features. Here is the geological column based on its periods, And up there is the tertiary layer where we have the mammals and the birds and all the creatures that we see today. But there's this interesting layer underneath which is called the Cretaceous. 
Now that's an interesting layer. Let's have a look at it in somewhat more detail. Here you have the Precambrian layers, then you have the Paleozoic, starting with the Cambrium, that's where all the first macro life forms came into existence according to the theory. Then you have the Triassic, then you have the Jurassic, and remember those who saw the movie Jurassic Park, that's when what lived? All the dinosaurs, supposedly, and then something happened, <laughs> and they were all gone. And science calls that the KT boundary. K K the Cretaceous, in German, it's Kreide, chalk layer, Kreide with a K, K, tertiary, T, K, T boundary, and here you have massive extinctions, and then you start with the top layers. Now, Cretaceous, what does that mean? Why is it called the Cretaceous layer? Well, it's called the Cretaceous layer because it consists of marine organisms. Here you have all these interesting suppositions of what this Cretaceous could have looked like with all these interesting marine creatures floating around. And in some areas, you can see this layer very prominently, like here at the White Cliffs of Dover, for example. You have this massive chalk layer. And in other areas of the world, you have a relatively flat chalk layer. Now, what does this chalk consist of? And remember, this is the layer we're talking about in the geological column. This is what it consists of under the microscope. If you put it under the microscope, you see all these microscopic bodies of algal skeletons consisting of calcium carbonate. Here are some more organisms. These are foraminifera shells. These are tiny little unicellular creatures in the ocean that consist of calcium carbonate. Foraminifera are tiny little unicellular organisms. This is basically what you'll see in the Cretaceous. All these marine organisms, all these shells, and all of this can only happen where? in water. Only happen in water. There's something else that's interesting. There's a layer over here in the uh, Bighorn Basin where you have the Mesozoic, Paleozoic layers underneath and then you have a Cenozoic layers on top. That's the young ones. So the boundary we're talking about is over there. On that line over there. That's where you would find chalk. Chalk deposits. Now what happens to form chalk? How does chalk form? Well, you see these marine organisms, when they settle down, when they die, and the organic material disappears, all that remains is this calcium carbonate shell. And that settles down and forms then a white layer. Does it happen today? Yes. Why are our ocean basins not full of chalk? Because the oceans are so deep, that as these materials form, they dissolve on the way down and nothing hits the bottom. Are you with me? But if you were to go diving in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, under the ocean, where the mountain tops are very high, on top of each of those mountains, under the Atlantic Ocean, on top, you would find a chalk layer. So it looks like you're swimming in the Alps. White-topped mountains. Really great. So how did that happen? You see, the ocean has to be shallow for the chalk to form. So the, the, this ocean that existed had to be a relatively shallow ocean. And how far did it extend? Now the Cretaceous layer is the one layer that is universal. Now take note. The Cretaceous layer is the one layer that stretches from continent to continent. And in some areas it's thick, in other areas, it's less thick, but it is universal and it covers every single continent. And it's on the same base rock. So my question to you is this. If that layer is universal, it tells us one thing. And that is what? That the whole world must have been underwater at the same time. And if that is a fact, then we can really stop this lecture right now. The deal's done. Then there was a universal flood. And that is so. Here's some more interesting facts. If you go to this area, you'll find a little mountain on top over there. It's called Beartooth Butte. 
And here are two huge ranges, the Big Horn Mountains and the Beartooth Mountains. And there's a fault there. So obviously what happened is this was lifted up. And this was lifted up. And in between are these layers, which are here in red, which represent the same sort of layers that you find in the bottom of the, of the Grand Canyon and some others. So the Paleozoic and Mesozoic layers are over there. But notice that on the edges they are bent up. Can you see that? They are bent up along the uplift of the mountain. So now imagine before this mountain range was there and you flatten it down, bring it down, and bring that down and make it flat and only the red layers cover it. And then water above that and imagine the chalk falling. And it lies on top of the red layers. Then comes the uplift. And this is bent up. Obviously, these layers must have been there when the uplift took place or else they wouldn't be bent up. Is that correct? But when you go to the top layers, they're not bent up. What does that tell you? It tells you that they were not there when the mountain was lifted up. So they came afterwards. Now what's that guy doing up there? Well, that is a relic. It does of the same material as down there. Now science has a problem with that. With its huge time scales and modern uplifts and all these things, how does this happen? How does that material get up there? Science has to actually push that mountain uphill 10,000 feet. Chup, 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 chup called thrusting. How does it get there? Here's an alternative. Maybe that's just a relic of what was on there in any case. So all the layers covered everything. When it came up, the water rushed down. And before this was washed away, what happened? The water was gone. And so here you have this debris layer of chalk. Now there's that mountain sitting on top. And it looks like it always sat there. It doesn't look like it's been pushed uphill for any time. The mountains, bare tooth, get their name from that little peak over there. And if you get to the top layers now, the ones that lie on the top, the tertiary ones, the young ones, so-called, you find this. These are shells that are orientated in direction of stream flow. What does that tell you? That they were deposited rapidly. They couldn't have happened slowly. Plus you have green leaves buried. That's very strange. Nothing like that happens today. Green leaves being buried. And then, if you take a modern scenario, like St. Helens eruption, where you had huge debris floats of wood and material, imagine such a situation. Imagine now that you have a world covered in water, and in it you have this algal bloom and this white layer of chalk forms. In some areas... It comes up sooner than in others, so the layer is thin. In other areas, it comes up later, so the layer is thick. How long would it form for those layers to form? The chalk, to be that thick. One would imagine thousands of years? No. Today we know algal blooms are like this, under disturbed circumstances. So those layers can form very, very rapidly. Within a few months, boom, there they are, and the months are there. Because even after the uplift, the ocean basins were still going down slowly in some areas. And by the way, we know that the ocean basins went down slowly. How do we know? Because there are coral islands in the Pacific. Now, coral cannot grow if it's not in contact with light. Cannot grow. Has to have light. So now, you find coral islands at the bottom of the Pacific. What are coral islands doing at the bottom of the Pacific? Dead coral with huge water column above it. Well, it couldn't have started growing down there. There's no light down there. So what's the only solution? The bottom must have been higher and it grew and it settled down too fast for the coral to keep up and it died. In other areas, you have coral going from the bottom to the top. So it must have gone down slow enough for the coral to keep up with a rate of drop. And we've worked out today that with coral growth rate, that is perfectly possible to put it into a short time frame. No problem whatsoever. So imagine now a destroyed world full of debris of millions and millions of trees buried or 
floating in the water. If you take the top layers, there's lots of evidence for water. Here you have algae, you have f um, swamp materials, you have water ferns, there's a fossil, there's the living one, you have nests of dragonflies, lots of wet environments, you have green leaves like this beech wood buried in Europe in the rocks, or this one over here, a leaf of Persian ironwood, which tells us that it must have been a very warm period. And then you, on top, you have these huge water basins. If you go to uh, the United States, if you go to Salt Lake, there you find this Salt Lake there today, which is just a tiny relic of a huge lake, which used to be Lake Lohontan. And you can still see on the, on the horizons the level of where this lake used to stand in the recent time and recent history, because this is right on top. If you go to the Sahara, the entire Sahara Desert is a basin that was recently underwater. In fact, if you go to the Sudan and to Ethiopia, which is today almost desert, just 2,000 years ago, there were huge areas of freshwater snails. So things must have been very wet in the not-so-distant past. Science will tell you, no, 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 hang on a second. If I look at the lakes today, and I look at the wall of the lake, I can see layers of mud. They call them valves. And they say, we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, thousands of valves. So everything is hundreds of thousands of years old. Because they say each one of those layers formed in a year. Well, here's a leaf buried in those valves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to 45 valves. You must agree, this is a pretty tough leaf. <laughs> Waiting 45 years to be buried. So these are not year rings at all. These are event rings. A rainstorm, valve. A change in the wind direction, valve. Anything can cause a valve. This is the largest brown cold field in the world. It's in Serbia. And I had the privilege of being there uh, not so long ago. It's a huge, huge coal field. One of the, it, it is the largest one in the world. And they are just digging this stuff out over there. And uh, as you look at it, you can just see the layers and layers and layers and layers of brown coal. In between, you have these little layers of mud, showing that this is a water deposit. And then you have these huge clumps or layers of white chalk. This chalk, in this case, is formed by a tiny little microorganism which is called radiolarians. So it's also a floating marine organism, and there they are. Now, what is a marine layer doing in a forest? Now, I had the privilege of going walking there with the geologists of the area. Here are two uh, shells that come out of this uh, forest or this layer of brown coal, would you agree that that's an interesting phenomenon to find in a forest? Do you have any marine shells floating around in your forests? Yes or no? I doubt it. This is the scientist who I went with. He is a trained geologist who grew up in the communist system. He was trained in the evolutionary theory, and uh, he walked with me and he said to me, you know what, I smoke a lot, he says. I said, why do you smoke a lot? That's not very healthy. And he said, I smoke a lot because I have to lie a lot. And here he's picking up a piece of this chalk, this radiolarian material, and he's saying, I know this all happened underwater, but I have to tell people that come here that this happened in a forest situation. This never happened underwater. This is a huge flood catastrophe. That's the only explanation. And if we look at the wood, you can pick it up. There it lies between the coal. This, some of it has formed coal. Some of it is still wood. Here's a piece where the bottom has formed coal and the top is still wood. So how old is it? How many millions of years do you think that's old? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage 
until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took how many of them away? All. All. Away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Everything was taken away. So the Bible says there was a flood. And the Bible says that the flood was a judgment. Here's a letter to Time magazine. Moses was hated in his day because he told the truth. If he lived in these dark times, he'd be twice as hated. Science cannot accede to a universal flood. So why do we have the features that we have today? If you look at the planet today, it certainly looks like at some stage it might have been stuck together, although the puzzle doesn't fit very well at all. But uh, in some areas, generally, if you take the shelves, it does have some form of fit. By far the best fit of the continents is at the base of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And if you look at the erosion rates that we have on the planet, on the, on the edges of the planet today, it is so rapid in some areas that it is amazing that this all still fits together. Do you know that the Bible talks about uh, Paul walking through the areas of the Middle East over there, and it talks about Ephesus where he was preaching. Ephesus used to be a harbor city in those days. You go to Ephesus today, it's a couple of miles inland. Now, when did it cease to be a harbor? In 800 AD. So all that has been filled in in just 1,200 years. Now, we're supposed to believe 126 million years of filling in and erosion and change and the puzzle still fits. That's the coast of Australia. The erosion is incredibly rapid along the edges. Do you know if you go to England, whole towns have disappeared over the side already. Whole towns have disappeared with erosion on the coastline. And it's happening so rapidly that if it were around for 126 million years, it should have been gone, all the continents, 12 times over. We really have to have to be very gullible in order to comprehend some of these things. Now, the Mid-Oceanic Ridge is 46,000 miles long. There it is. And it stretches all the way up to there. And you have these islands up there, Iceland, where you still have some activity even to this day. I'll take you there in a moment. So if we put the, the continents together, they seem to fit, although you have to cut out huge pieces in order to make them fit, but nevertheless, let's say they do fit. Could this have been rapid rather than slow? If you take the Horn of Africa, that certainly looks as though it was together some stage before. Was this rapid or was it slow? If it was rapid... And when did it happen? If the story of the ark is true, how did the animals redistribute themselves over the planet? These are interesting questions. Now here is some interesting research that was done by Arthur Chadwick, or is still in the process of being done, on paleocurrents as tools. Now, what are paleo? This is fascinating stuff. A paleocurrent. A paleocurrent are flow directions derived from features of sedimentary rock that reveal the direction or sense of the current of wind or water that deposited the sediment. All sedimentary rocks contain paleocurrent indicators, some which can be read and interpreted. So now if you go and look at the various layers of rock, some of it is exposed because the top layer is cracked off, and you can see in which way did the water flow over this layer of rock. So by looking at features, you can say that the deposition over here was in that direction. By looking at these features, you could say the deposition here was in one direction and there it was in another direction. If you look over here, you can see the deposition was in that direction. Here, you can see, if you look at this cross bedding, the deposition was in this direction. So now it should be interesting. If science says that each one of those layers was once the surface of the earth, Let's have a look at them individual all over the world and see in which way the water flowed supposedly during that time. That would be interesting. So what do we know? The results are there of some million measurements in the database. That's pretty much. 
North America, South America, Australia, Great Britain, parts of Western Europe are fairly well presented, so that's a huge chunk of the world. Africa, Antarctica, Central Europe, modestly. China, Russia, and most of Asia, poorly represented. But we have a pretty good global picture over here. Now, first I want to tell you something about a basin. A basin is something like a hollow that can hold water. That's a basin. So here's a kid sitting in a basin. Now, if you have a continent, a continent has basins, and a continent has areas where water flows in a particular direction towards the ocean. So in the United States of America, for example, there are these basins, and the water will flow from all the directions into the basins. Plus, there will be flow directions out towards the ocean. And that is a typical modern scenario. So, if we have a look at the, the general uh, appearance today, here on the one side, the water will be flowing, generally speaking, towards the coast. There will be basins in the center, basins where water flows from all directions into the basins, and then you'll have flow directions to the oceans, etc., on the other sides. And then you can have, between all of them, you can have rivers flowing towards the oceans. That's a typical modern world. And that's what any world should have looked like if the conditions were roughly similar in the past. Is that correct? Okay. Do we have that? The answer is no. If we go to the Paleozoic, that's at the bottom, the lowest layer, we find this very interesting phenomenon. Instead of having basins, there are none. From all the measurements that have been made, it appears that the water flowed in this direction. In other words, generally speaking, from the one side here, from the east coast, generally to the southwest, right across the continent. If you go to the next layer, the Mesozoic, what do you find? The total reverse. Suddenly, things are going in the opposite direction. If you look at the somewhat higher layers, the tertiary, we seem to find somewhat different patterns, some going this way, some going that way, some going this way. So there seems to be some form of restoration take, taking place, a little bit higher. We seem to have some going this way, some going that way, others going that way, and still higher, we seem to have some reversals. So what do we find? Summary. Pre-Cambrian. North America paleocurrents are variable across the craton, show no distinctive continent-wide pattern. So right down at the bottom, it's the same as what you would expect today. So maybe the Precambrian was once the surface of the Earth. That's consistent. The Paleozoic, suddenly you show patterns that are continent-wide and typically flow towards the west and southwest across the continent. <laughs> That's impossible. You cannot have water flowing from one side of the United States all the way across to the other side, and Canada, and everything else. And then in the next time, all the way in the opposite direction. In the Mesozoic, exactly the opposite. It goes from the west to the east, and then in the Cenozoic, there seems to be some uh, continued pattern of the Cretaceous Paleozoic, but become variable, so they start becoming normal again. So... What happened here in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic is inexplicable. These trends are not expected in the standard model of geology. The trends reveal processes that were much larger than anything that you see today, and they are consistent with the global flood. Now let's go to South America. What would you expect in the Precambrium and in the Paleozoic? Precambrium, you have basins, you have all these strange things, not many measurements around. If you go a little bit higher, suddenly, boom. The water flowed boom, right across the continent. Can it do that today? No. What happens here today? What's there? A huge mountain range. There's no way that the water can flow from one side right across to the other side, exactly as in North America. Wow! Water flowed right across North and South America in one direction in the Paleozoic. Boom. And in the Mesozoic, exactly in the opposite direction. Woof. Is this possible? No. Only with a universal flood would this be possible. If you come up higher, 
then you start getting variability again, as you would expect. So summary, if you read it through, exactly the same pattern as you have in North America. This is unbelievable. Conclusion, supercontinental trends are not expected in the standard model of conventional basinal geology. Cannot be there. There's no explanation forthcoming for what we can see in these things. So these trends are consistent with a predicted by a catastrophic global model. It's the only thing that can explain it. If you put all the continents together, you have a universal pattern. So the sediments seem to have come here from the center, and the flow directions were universal. So this is an amazing story, which seems to tell us that there was a universal flood after all. I want to take you all to a very exciting place. In many areas of the world, you have petrified forests. This is what a petrified tree looks like. That's a tree that has turned to stone. Now, in some areas of the world, you have some amazing features. Like if you go to Yellowstone National Park, for example, if you go to Mount Horniday over there, you will find one layer of petrified forests, one on top of the other. And these trees are standing there in the upright position. Now, science has always taught that these trees stand like that because they grew there in the past. So this tells us that there were long periods of stability, so there could not have been a universal flood. In fact, these petrified trees were used to ridicule the model of a universal flood. So they look, literally stand there. They are huge. They look as uh, if they grew there forever. But did they? The only difference between them and modern trees is they are stone, solid stone. And you have these layers. Interestingly, the layers are flat, one on top of the other. Now here's some interesting features. Here is one that stretches through more than one layer. But if you look at it, there are some interesting phenomena. Number one... There are no roots. The roots are ripped off. Number two, there's no bark. And if you look on the sides, they don't have any branches. Now, what science is saying is that these forests grew there. Then there was an eruption of a volcano. Ash came down and buried the forest. And then a new forest grew. And then there was an eruption and buried the forest. And then a new forest grew. And then there was an eruption and it buried the forest. 40, 45 times after each other, and now you have all these layers, over 40 layers of forests. But they're all flat, which is very strange. And some of them have upright trees, and they have horizontal trees in them. Now we're looking at these trees. If you dig them out, there you can see there's a flat one, and here are a whole lot of horizontal ones. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one lying over there. And the interesting thing is, they're all facing in the same direction. Now, this is weird. It did the trees then in the past always fall over in the same direction? So what you do is you measure it. So they went to all the various layers and found, well, in this layer, it's in that direction. And in the next one, in that direction, in that direction. So these layers of forests are orientated according to stream direction. If you take a modern forest, you don't pick up those patterns at all. So what happened? Something must have changed. Well, this is what it looks like today. Here are two layers which can be explained by science as constituting the forest floor. So when everything gets covered, at the bottom you have the forest floor. But this is very interesting because there are two forest floors just a hand's breadth apart. Are these two forests that were just a hand's breadth apart? That doesn't make much sense. Secondly, when you take this to the lab and you grind it down and you have a look, then you'll see that the material in it is water sorted. Ha! So did these forests form underwater? Because if you pick up a forest floor today, everything is jumbled up. A twig, a leaf, a twig, a leaf, a twig, a leaf, needles, pines, everything mixed up. But not here. Here it's water sorted. 
That's another interesting scenario. Here's a tree dug out. Notice that the roots are definitely ripped off. Now, if a forest grew and it got covered and the trees got buried upright, would the roots be ripped off, yes or no? No, it doesn't make any sense. Notice the layering that we see over here. And here's another interesting thing. This is a turbidite flame. That's a mud flame. So this must have happened under water. Now, a solution to this problem came when Mount St. Helens erupted. Here we still have a lot of volcanic material and geysers. And this was St. Helens before the eruption. Notice this beautiful glacier on the top. And when this first eruption came, then the water melted and rushed down the south side. There were two cycles of eruption. These were the lakes that surrounded the mountains. This is Spirit Lake with a glacier on top and the beautiful forests around. And then in 1980, the mountain erupted, not with an explosion. It just erupted and the ice melted on the top and formed this flood down the south side. Notice how the trees started to be ripped out. And notice that these trees don't have any branches on them as they float in the water. Then it was a great catastrophe. Everything was covered in mud. Houses were buried, all kinds of things. A month later, there was the huge eruption, which I'll talk about in a moment. But on the south side, this is what we see. Trees ripped out, and here they are. What do you notice? They are orientated in the direction of stream flow, and they have no branches, and their roots are ripped off. Here are some giant ones that were ripped out like that. And here you can see dents in the trees, because as the trees roll in the water, the branches are ripped off, and as they bash up against each other, the bark is stripped, and so these trees are without bark, they don't have any roots, and they don't have any branches. And if you look at the layering, it looks exactly like in the petrified forests. Then a month later, there was this earthquake, and the greatest landslide witnessed by modern man took place, and the top third of the mountain slid away and released huge pressure, and the mountain erupted. But notice that the eruption takes place to the north side. The south side is unaffected. So we have two sides of a story here. This is amazing stuff. And it explodes with a force of 500 Hiroshima atomic bombs. Boom. And puts enough debris up there to account for one ton of material for every person living on the planet. Cars are slung kilometers across the terrain, huge trucks were transported kilometers across, and the forests were stripped bare and buried. This is what it looked like before the eruption, and that's what it looked like after the eruption. So this huge mass of material came and crashed into the lakes. Now you can imagine what that did to the water. What would that do if a huge amount of material just poof, fell into a lake? Well, it would displace the lake. So there was a huge tidal waves just went, and they just rushed through the area, and they cut canyons, and they gathered the debris of wood and washed it back into the newly forming lakes as they formed. Here's a steam crater that formed. There's a human being standing over there as a scale. So hot material lands in the water, explodes, and forms that crater. Here's a canyon. This canyon formed in seconds when this water rushed through, and this material here was formed during this eruption. So all of this happened within a few minutes. And if they look at the layering, they would imagine that this must have taken millions of years of time, but it happened in a very short time period. Huge trees transported ripped out, some of them sheared off by the blast as if cut by a blade, and transported many miles in these mud flows in the upright direction. Here's another one, transported upright in a flow direction. Huge quantities gathered in the lakes. This is Spirit Lake. Here are these things gathering, 
And then very soon, some of these trees started floating upright. Now, here's an interesting story. So they wanted to have a look. So down went the divers. And what did they find at the bottom? Huge quantities of bark. Thick, thick layers of bark. Did you know that some coal seams consist of nothing but bark? Inexplicable in a forest situation. Impossible to explain. Here it is. The bark settles down underneath. The logs float on the top. The brown coal that I showed you of the largest mine in the world consists of the logs, and some of the lower layers consist of nothing but bark. So here these trees float upright. Now what if there was another eruptive cycle and they were buried? While they were floating upright and mud buried them from the side, how would they be buried? Upright. So they took a scanner and they measured how many trees there were in this lake, Spirit Lake, floating upright. And they found 19,000 trees. So if we go back to our petrified forests, you see all these layers of forests with upright and horizontal trees in them. And these could have formed rapidly. Now, one interesting thing that they did is they took samples from all across the column and sent it to the lab for analysis. And guess what they found? Each eruptive cycle today has a special chemical fingerprint. You see, as the magma forms under the volcano, it's new material. When it blasts to the top, the chamber at the bottom is empty and has to fill up again, and the mountain is quiet until it has built up enough pressure for the next cycle. Now today they know that if those cycles are more than three months apart, then the chemistry is different. Well, here, the chemistry at the bottom and at the top is exactly the same. So this tells us that the whole process couldn't have taken longer than three months. That fits beautifully into the story. We can also see why the trees are orientated, because obviously it happened in water. And even the upright trees are buried in a particular way. Not all trees are perfectly round. So let's say it has a big rootstock on the one side. It'll be orientated in the direction of stream flow. Now, if this was a local phenomenon, just here in the United States, that would be one thing. But it's universal. This is Africa, the petrified forests, Exactly the same scenario. They are stream orientated. They don't have any branches. They don't have any bark. They're all lying in the direction of stream flow. Their branches are ripped off. The exact same scenario is in Europe, in Australia, here on your continent, everywhere in the world you find this. But surely it will take millions of years for that tree to turn into stone. Well, here are the amazing stone bears of Yorkshire. There's a little stream in Yorkshire which is high in silicon, which is what you would expect after a universal flood as well. And they come there and they hang their teddy bears in the water. And the time needed for that teddy bear to turn into solid stone depends on the size of the teddy bear. Larger porous items, large teddy bears, clothing, take 6 to 12 months. Non-porous items, such as the top hat of a fireman helmet, can take up to 18 months to be encased in solid stone. There they are, solid stone. Now I want to take you to one of the exciting modern-day disasters. This is the island of Surtsey. This island formed in 1963, right there in the top in Iceland. This is a brand new island. And as this island formed, geologists had a perfect opportunity to study how the terrain changes over time. And guess what? They are rewriting the books of geology. Because processes that they considered to take millions of years are being realized here in one lifetime. And so new evidence is coming which shows that all the geological features that supposedly took so long to develop happened rapidly. For example here, this beach formation, where all this material has to be eroded down to find beach sand, 
happened in just eight months. Just eight months, and it was a done deal. It's a very beautiful place if you've never been to Iceland. Just take a warm jacket. It gets pretty chilly. That's why it's called Iceland. Beautiful glacial waterfalls, beautiful uh, shorelines with black lava sand, very, very pretty, very active today. No pollution in this area because all they use is thermal heat. So here's a nice hot pool. There is a power station which uses only the heat of the earth. So what's coming out there is not smoke but just steam for the steam turbines. And the advantage is that you can bathe in the hot water as you look at the scene. Now, I went to this place because in the recent history, there was a major disaster over here. Here are a bunch of people that helped me to take a few pictures over there. There was a flood disaster there in 1996, which could be studied in detail by modern technology. So here is some of the uh, aftermath of that. Giant bridges swept away. It was a huge catastrophe. These are flood bridges, so they are built to uh, withstand things like that. These are the huge glaciers coming down. In fact, the largest glacier in Europe is on Iceland, and it's absolutely magnificent. And here in front, you have these huge basins where these glaciers came down. Now, the glacier covers volcanic material. And under the glacier, there are active volcanoes. Now, imagine what happened. A giant volcano erupts under the largest glacier in Europe. What do you think will happen? Well, a huge flood resulted because the hot lava melted the glacier, forming a huge quantity of water, which lifted up the whole glacier on the side and the water rushed out from underneath, washing canyons like this three kilometers wide within a very short time period. Absolutely magnificent stuff. We took a few pictures of what it looks like today, so I'll let this man tell you a little bit about it. He's just as ugly as I am. In 1996, Iceland experienced one of its great natural flood disasters. What happened here in this area is an incredible story. On the top of that ridge over there lies the largest glacier in Iceland, some 11% of its total surface. And glaciers come all the way down, as you see in all the ridges around. And there was a volcanic eruption, and one of the inland lakes, as a result of all the melted water, rose above its normal level. And then it crashed through the glacial barrier and washed out of this area through this huge ridge uh, that you see in the back there, washing a canyon three kilometers wide and bringing down huge quantities of water, washing away the bridge and uh, creating this huge floodplain. And all of this happened in a very, very short time, demonstrating the power of catastrophic floods. Now, the advantage is that this happened in 1996, so we can actually see it happening. And I'll show you what happened over there. This is the relic, and this shows you this huge girder just bent as if it didn't exist. It turned out that the new cauldron was directly above a subglacial ridge that was probably formed in the eruption of 1938, which resulted in a massive outburst flood in the river Skederau. By midday, a large cauldron had formed in the ice cap, with a long trough stretching across to the Grimsworth Lake. On October 2nd, the eruption broke through the ice cap, and by the next day, it was in full swing. It was clear that water was flowing under the ice cap to Lake Grimsworth, where the water level was rising quickly. The volcano belched ash and gas high into the air, Flashes of lightning in the ash column show how electrified the atmosphere of this violent eruption was. Stupendous energy had gone into melting thousands of cubic meters of glacial ice in such a short time 
to form this colossal gorge. Besides the eruption itself, it was of great value for geologists to be able to observe the melting of the ice and the huge release of water that resulted from it. More than three cubic kilometers of water, more than in the whole of Lake Thingvatlavat, the largest lake in Iceland, accumulated in Grimsvatn in the space of a few weeks. The Greensart Lake is a sort of reservoir for the water which is released in these floods. When the pressure of the water reaches a critical point, the glacial ice is lifted up and the water streams out underneath it, emerging in a violent flood on the coastal plain area of Skederasanthir. Scientists did not expect this year's flood to be so large, but they were mistaken. The peak flow rate was between 40 and 50,000 cubic meters per second about 4,000 times the river's normal rate of flow in winter. Here are some unique shots showing the beginning of the flood. They were taken at the source of the river Gigia, just after the flood began. Here we can see clearly how the water carves a hollow out of the sand closer and closer to the ice in an amazingly short time. It's almost unbelievable to see the titanic force released when the water bursts out from underneath the edge of the glacier. Even though it was tens of meters thick, the edge of the ice could not withstand the strain and broke up like an eggshell. The flood thundered on for two days, reaching its peak flow after only about 12 hours. It raged across the sand flats at terrific speed and with a force that beggared all description. Many of these huge blocks of ice weigh anything up to a hundred tons each. It's an amazing sight to watch them being carried along and tumbling over like toy building blocks in the flood. Up on the glacier, blocks of ice the size of large buildings broke out and laid scattered around the surface. Perhaps this scene shows best what colossal forces were at work here how tiny and helpless man is in comparison with the stupendous might of nature. The scratches and ruts on the surface show how the massive blocks of ice slid long distances like tiny pebbles across the glacier. A lot of damage was expected to roads, bridges, flood barriers and power lines. Before the flood, preventative work went on round the clock. Flood channels were dug across the road and across flood barriers in some places to try to direct the flood water where it would cause the least damage. In other places, loads of stones were banked up for protection. Finally, when the flood broke out on November 5th, six weeks after the eruption started, the preventative measures proved their worth. Though at the same time it was clear in the first few hours of the flood that nothing within human capacity could avoid a great deal of destruction. The blocks of ice smashed the concrete pillars and iron girders of the bridge like matchwood. Well, that gives us some idea on a small scale, what could have happened? And if this could happen in a tiny little flood like that, what could happen in a huge universal flood as we saw in the previous scenario? So here we have a layer of chalk covering the whole world, which means the whole world was underwater at the same time. We have evidence of huge gorges formed within seconds, we have layers and layers of petrified wood and of coal deposits that defy all explanation other than by a universal flood. We have layers and layers and layers of material buried with marine organisms interspersed everywhere between them. 
If we do not have a universal flood in that model, then I don't know what it is. No wonder in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says from verses 3 to 7, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So nothing has ever changed. That's the law of uniformitarianism. That's what science teaches today. And for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, so that God created it whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So the scientific world today does not acknowledge the destruction of the world by a universal flood. It cannot do so because it would destroy their entire thesis of origins. So if the Bible says they are willingly ignorant of these things, then why would that be? Well, isn't that fascinating and that it continues to say, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now that's a fascinating point. If the flood ever did occur, then it was as a consequence of a judgment, according to the Bible. As a consequence of a judgment. So there was a judgment in the past, and the Bible says there will be a judgment in the future. If you want to make people complacent so that they do not believe in a judgment in the future, well, remove the judgment in the past. Then we can progress from, from bad to better and better to whatever level we can achieve. Maybe we can all become gods and start floating around and there is no judgment whatsoever. So you decide tonight after having looked at all of these features, whether there was a universal flood on this planet or not. If you choose that the evidence points to a universal flood, then that destroys the current paradigm of thinking in the evolutionary world. It destroys it. If you choose to stay with the other, that's fine. Then don't miss the next exciting episode because now we're going to look at the fossils. And this is where it gets interesting. Bring the young ones along. They love it. Bring your kids along. Let them have a look for themselves what is out there. What were the dinosaurs really like? What was it like to live in that time, if it was a time at all? Was there such a thing as Tyrannosaurus Rex? What did he look like? What did he do? How long ago did he exist? These are intriguing questions that tickle every mind and especially the young people of today. Come and have a look at tomorrow's evidence and decide for yourself whether what the scriptures say is right or what science says is right. The choice is yours. Thank you for coming this evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.